feeling enlivened after listening to those uh, voluntaries from uh, Mas the Messiah um, songs. Um, thank you, Peter, for playing them at special request from Grandpa. Um, they really capture what we've been looking at in the this series so far, and we've still got a couple of classes to go as well, so that's exciting as well. Tonight, our brother Brian will be uh, doing his third talk in this four-part series uh, to the topic, Unto Us a Son is Given, which is such an iconic phrase from the chapter we've got ahead of us tonight. Um, before we sing our first hymn together, um, as we are singing tonight, just a reminder that after the class, if you can grab a fresh mask from out in the foyer, that'd be great. Um, so we'll start our class together by singing hymn 196, which contains so many of those phrases we'd know so well from Isaiah 9, followed by prayer. Father, we come before you now so thankful for the Messiah that you've given to us, have given to the world, that we might have a hope of life and hope of living for eternity with you and with that Messiah in your kingdom. Father, we're so thankful for the life we have now and the hope that you've blessed us with. We thank you for your great love. We thank you for your word, which we can read tonight, and for these awesome messianic prophecies that you gave in, your, in, in the book of Isaiah, of Isaiah through Isaiah so many years ago. Father, we thank you for uh, the firm grounding this gives to our faith, that prophecy gives to our faith. We pray that our faith would be strengthened once again tonight and that we can go away from here uh, from, understanding your son and yourself a little more and that we might be inspired to show show your characteristics and the characteristics of your messiah to 
those around us, that when he does return to this earth, we might be able to stand with him. We pray that you'd be with our night together. We thank you so much for all, our mem- all the members of our ecclesia, whether they're here tonight or not, and we pray that you'd be with those who might need your special care at this time. We pray you'd send your son back to this earth very soon. It's in his name we approach you now. Amen. So, as I mentioned, our chapter for tonight that we'll be considering is Isaiah chapter 9, and our brother Dave Luke will read that for us now. together, Isaiah chapter 9. Nevertheless, the timidness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first the lighting afflicted the land, when he at first, sorry, when at first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Nephtali, and afterward did not grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy of in harvest and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. And every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire, as for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The Lord sent a word into Jacob and it hath lighted upon Israel and all the people shall know, even Ephraim, and the inhabitant of Samaria that say in the pride of stoutness of heart, the bricks are fallen down, but we will build with hewn stones, and the sycamores are cut down, but we will change them into cedars. Therefore the Lord shall set up the adversaries of resin against him and join his enemies together. The Syrians therefore and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with open mouth. For all this his for all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. For the people turneth not unto him that smiteth them, neither do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore the Lord will cut off from Israel head and tail, branch and rush in one day. The ancient and honourable, he is the head, and the prophet that teacheth lies, he is the tall tail. For the leaders of his people cause them to err, 
they that are led of them are destroyed. Therefore the Lord shall have no joy in their young men, neither shall have mercy on their fatherless and widows. For every one is an hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaketh folly. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. For wickedness burneth as the fire, it shall devour the briars and thorns, and shall kindle in the thickets of the forest, and they shall mount up like the lifting up of smoke. Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts is the land darkened, and the people shall be as the fuel of the fire. No man shall be spare his brother, and he shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry, and he shall eat on the left hand, and they shall not be satisfied. They shall eat every man the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh, Ephraim, and Ephraim, Manasseh. And they shall together, they together shall be against Judah. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Thanks, Brother Dave. Oh, it's a very exciting chapter with a lot to unpack. Um, so we look forward to our brother Brian's words to us tonight. I think, Brother Chairman, if we have too many piano fort uh, presentations before our class, we mightn't have as large a class. <laughs> That was a very, very lovely rendition for us. And I think it really does inspire, doesn't it? You know, the, something I really admire the English uh, for is their, their retention of noble music. They were responsible for a large percentage of it and they perpetuated, I suppose it probably started in uh, such a bold way when and Messiah was first presented in one of their great uh, theatres in London. And it was the opening one, and the king was present. And uh, this is a true story. When it got to the Hallelujah Chorus, he stood. He didn't wait for anyone else. He stood, and the whole place stood. And that's happened in England ever since. It probably happens still now in Australia to some degree, but I'm not sure if it's as fundamentally performed like that today. But isn't that a, a good heritage? The king of the land, without anybody telling him what to do, he just stood because he thought, I'm a king, not like this one we're singing about. And so he gave honour to God's provider, provision of a king, which was a very noble thing to do. And I think you know, the atmosphere of that has affected oh, 100, 100 years of music, I suppose, because that becomes a sort of normal way to think about it. It's a good heritage, isn't it? Very good heritage. I think Auntie Ruth probably liked all that. <laughs> Our reading tonight shows that there's it's quite a lot of things to work out. And we're not doing all of chapter 9. In fact, we're not doing up to verse 12 even. But we certainly have a very challenging situation. Where are we up to in our, our Emmanuel prophecy studies? Well... The first mention of the word Emmanuel was in chapter 7. Do you remember that? What did it tell us? Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. What's this Emmanuel? What did it tell us? There's something being developed here because we heard the name again tonight. Well, verse 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. 
What's the sign? A virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. It was really an amazing thing to call your son, wasn't it? What, a boy born, born in a house? And you call him by the name of God with us, which is what Emmanuel means? That wasn't the only thing about verse 14 that was remarkable. It says, the Lord himself shall give you. Give you. God will give you. What an astonishing thing to say. But more than that, the one who gives conception is a virgin. Virgins don't conceive. But all of those things are wrapped into that verse. And the person who first looked at that would have said, hey, you've got a lot of errors in that sentence. But he has no errors in it at all. And that's the marvellous thing about the Emmanuel prophecy. There was a time when people didn't know anything about the Son of God. The thoughts wasn't about. There was a concept of Messiah, but the concept that Messiah was going to be a son of God, a son of a virgin, was again on several accounts extremely remarkable. So if you and I find it a challenge to get right into this, we can imagine how those who first heard of these terms would have felt very, very challenged by the language that the prophet was using. But he meant every word. God meant every word that was said. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son. As we mentioned at an earlier class, the person who listened to that carefully and thought about it, the bells are going to ring, aren't they, of some other passages in the Old Testament. And the, the one passage that would ring more certainly than any others would be... Sorry. <laughs> it's got to be the promise made to David, doesn't it? Second Samuel 7. Imagine how the prophet felt. I mean, he invented the, the words, but uh, the meaning came from his, his God. It would have stunned him. He would have thought, did I say it right? Did I get it right? Have I repeated it right? Well, Second Samuel 7, I make no excuse for turning for a passage that even our youngest Sunday school students probably know backwards. But it's a very critical passage, and particularly in our consideration of Emmanuel. When they, thy days be fulfilled, God says to David, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee. David will die, and so those that came after him. But I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels. David, there's going to be an inheritance, a line of inheritance in your name. And what's more, I will be right behind that. I will establish his kingdom. God will. But it's still not the same as Isaiah chapter 7, is it? He shall build an house for my name. What a thing for God to say. He shall build a house for my name, for David's name perhaps. But it's greater than that. He shall build a house for my name, for God's name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. But Isaiah is saying more than that. Verse 14 says, I will be his father. But you've said it's my child. Thy seed, verse 12. I will be his father. There's a challenge, isn't it? 
on anything that had been said before, that was a challenge. It was a new statement, a fresh statement. God says, I will be his father. However could that be? So the integrating of that chapter, that to passage with our Isaiah chapter 7 is a very, very critically important uh, thing to do in our, in our study because it shows that they had waited a long time, hadn't they, from there till there, to Isaiah, to his, no doubt, great shock, announced something that was right on the theme, but it was singular. It was, it was not exactly what was promised to David. It was something more acute. My mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. So it's going to be a long seed. Thine house and thy kingdom and shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Yes, remarkably fresh things for God to make in the promise to mankind. But Isaiah's comment went further, didn't it? It said in verse 14 of chapter 7, The Lord himself shall give you a sign a virgin. shall conceive. To David he had said, I will be his father. A virgin shall conceive. There's a development on that. And bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Well, how is it then that a virgin conceives and it's yet God with us? What a challenging matter it was. I know that we've heard it long and hard, haven't we? But I think it's still very wonderful to let that sink right in and to feel that in our understanding of the truth, my dear brothers and sisters, we are so blessed, aren't we? We don't have difficulty in that, but, but what's a, if you believed in the Trinity, you wouldn't know what to think, would you? What a muddle it will become. But it's not a muddle to us. We say that humbly, but it isn't, is it? Great, remarkable, challenging. Something to be so thankful for, but it's a very great statement. And as I would have picked that up like a flash and thought, wow, how is that so? Well, like we will educate him, verse 15, butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. So that's why this prophecy of, of Emmanuel is so, so remarkably wonderful. And in the, the second chapter on this, in this group, chapter 8, Emmanuel occurs there twice, doesn't it? If you've got those marked, it is very important to mark them because otherwise we lose the thread, don't we? But in verse 8, He shall pass through Judah, he shall overflow and go over, he shall reach even to the, to the neck and the stretching out of his wings, this is Assyria, shall fill the breadth of thy land. O Emmanuel. If you are Emmanuel, do you really have to worry? That's the power of that, isn't it? It's a statement about Assyria's just running over all those Middle Eastern countries and doing whatever she wanted to do. Like as if the, the two great rivers, there were two, the, the Tigris and the Euphrates, one flowing down like this and the other one flowing like that. And a great deal of the condensment of, of water in, those, in that whole territory went into those two rivers. And so in that verse, it's saying how that there's, it's just as though God got hold of the rivers and made them a person and that person was, was coming all over those place, places with a, with a drive and thrust and power of those two rivers. Well, they dominated the country, see, so that was a, it was a very good figure of speech. He shall pass through Judah. Judah? What? Assyria? Pass through Judah? 
They're not related in land. One's over here, one's over there. There's 1,500 miles between them. How can that possibly be? He's not talking about water. He's talking about the king of Assyria. And uh, Assyria's dominant streams were those two rivers. So they were a good feature, as it were, to speak about the powers of Assyria. Associate yourselves, O ye people, and ye shall be broken in pieces. He makes ridicule of the arrangements that they had made with other countries. There was Judah being attacked now by a combination of Israel above them, the ten tribes, who is now in confederation with Syria, a Gentile power. Those two are coming against, against uh, Judah. It was terrible. It was wicked. But the king of Assyria, of the king of, um, of uh, Judah, Ahaz, was a very wicked man. And to make alliances with a foreign power didn't worry him at all. This man was absolutely rock bottom. And among all the things that he did, and there's many of them, you can make a whole page of them, many things that he did, we're talking about a child, a precious child in these promises. One called Emmanuel. Put great value on that. The story's about that. It's developing the, the story that was given to David. Developing it. Do you know what he did to that line? Ahaz's children were in that line. They were in the royal line. Do you know what he did with them? He burnt them. He broke their bones and burnt them. king of Judah with that kind of mentality it's astounding isn't it absolutely astounding that he ever was allowed to be there and the other thing that he did in agreement with this I suppose is that he filled them up with rubbish with the philosophy of the surrounding gods of the, of the Gentiles associate yourselves verse 9 Ye people, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Your allegiances will come to nothing. You go up there, make an agreement with the ten tribes, and you make it with a, a foreign with a foreign country. Don't think that that will succeed, is what God, through the prophet, is saying. They're very, very major issues. So put a little note there. A has the decadent. Rarely is there someone that exceeds Ahaz when it comes to terms of wickedness. And that it was no accident. Verse 10 uses the term again. Take counsel together and it shall come to naught. They're making all these allegiances without any principles involved in them. What's Judah getting involved in, a, in an agreement with a foreign power? Take counsel together. Well, says God, it shall come to nothing. Speak the word and it shall not stand. Why? For God is with us. That's where we make our confederation. That's where we make our agreements. And Judah didn't have a person or a country to make that agreement with. And God says that because of what's happening, there'll be something far worse than the ten tribes or Syria. What's going to come is the Assyrian, the, the Assyrian in verse 7. That's why he's warning them of this. Much worse than Syria or the uh, ten tribes. So all of their making of agreements is bypassed by God. And he says in verse 15, many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. In other words, all those words that were used in making these confederacies, all will come to nothing. Many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. What then is the resolution to our, our nation's problems as we look out and look at the that which is all around us. What do we do? Take out your Bible. That's what he says. Bind up the testimony. You've all got it there in your homes. 
in your meeting places. Bind up the testimony. There's where you make your confederacy. That's where your bond is. That's where your heart is. Seal the law among my disciples. And I will wait upon Yahweh that hideth his face from the house of Jacob and I will look for him. The prophet's not losing him. I will wait upon Yahweh. He's not looking at us, but I'm looking for him. Isn't that a beautiful statement? I think that's the sense of it, don't you? In other words, God has sort of turned away from them because of the wicked things that happen. But the prophet says, but I'm keeping my eyes fixed upon him. You know, that's so helpful for our daily life, isn't it? We're a rare people that are doing that. There's no, a um, little lounge having a, a cup of tea and there was these four older people in, behind me the other day and I just couldn't help dangle an ear in that direction. And you know, I was very pleased to hear that these four elderly folk were talking about something that was highly religious, highly interesting from that point of view. And they were saying to each other with very downcast look, well, they wouldn't understand even what it was, would they today? It wouldn't mean anything to them. And the other one said, no, that's right, they think it's all silly. That's our world. And those older people, not just Christadelphians, they could see that that was true. So our position and with our children, with our ecclesia, becomes sharper and clearer for that. It's inspirational to us, and to our minds and our policy. It's to, the, it's to the scriptures that we must go. There's nowhere else to go. And I will wait upon Yahweh that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. What a beautiful statement from the prophet. Behold, I and the children whom Yahweh hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from Yahweh of hosts. He wasn't just building a family. God had given him children whose names implied what was going to happen. Here Jashab means the son of my right hand. And uh, Meir Shalal Hashbaz means someone that is certainly going to do what needs to be done. That was the big word. Four passages to it, four parts to it. And it meant God means what he says. Put it on big plates, as it were, and, and declare it to the populace, because God really means what he's saying. And when they shall say unto you, seek unto them that have familiar spirits. This is Ahaz, you see. This is the king. That's his business. Selling apostasy. Seek unto, unto them that have familiar spirits, unto wizards that peep and that mutter. Absolute nonsense, rubbish in fact. Says the pro prophet despairingly, should not a people seek unto their God? Of course that was right. Making all these agreements one with the other and and with a religion that had no basis in truth? Should not a people seek unto their God? For the living to the dead? That's a question mark. Because it was so stupid. The answer was obviously no. Of course they don't go to the dead to find out the, where they're going. So verse 20 repeats what was said in verse 18 to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. You know, this is remarkably wonderful for Christadelphians who have such a, an earnest belief about the truth of Almighty God. We don't just pick up religion and handle it like any old other person might. We pick up and and read it and wish to understand it because we really know that that's where the truth is. What a beautiful statement that is. 
to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Do we mention at the end of that last class that verse 21 and 22 are really packaged in with verse 1 and 2 of chapter 9? And so that's how we'll treat them from here on. So verse 21. They shall pass through it hardly be stead and hungry. Be stead meaning things are rough and difficult. And with it there is hunger. They shall pass through this difficult time and time of hunger, of lack of food. When they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their God and look upward, but not to worship, it, worship him. They shall look unto the earth and behold trouble and darkness. They don't know where to go. Where's the way to go? They're not looking to the law and to the testimony. So they don't really know where they're going. They shall look unto the earth, verse 22, and behold, trouble and darkness. There was darkness. It's the end of verse 20. No light. Consequently, consequently being without that light, they didn't know which direction they were going. They shall fret themselves with indecision and no solution to their problem, and curse their king and their God. They cursed their king, mightn't have been so bad, but they had him all mixed up in the same puddle, muddle as well. They were partly with Ahaz. Terrible to think about it, isn't it? Terrible to think that Ahaz's, Ahaz's children among them was Hezekiah among those children, some of whom he destroyed. And he's still king. You see what a blessing Hezekiah was, that God should give him a child, and that child then lived. He came to the throne at 25 years of age. And he, he routed the idolatry, absolutely routed it. What a good thing it was that he came. And Ahaz was gone. They shall look on... Look unto the earth and behold trouble and darkness. See, that's that darkness. Do without light. Shall look unto the earth. No answers. You don't know what to do. Which direction to go. Behold trouble and darkness. Dimness, which is like darkness, isn't it? Dimness of anguish. Unpleasant times of life when there's no certainty of the direction. And they shall be driven to darkness. Do you know that's just like the world at the moment, isn't it? They don't know. They don't know where to go with this thing. And I suppose really it's not a bad thing to think about what our attitude ought to be in the middle of it. Be cheerful. Be thankful for what you have got. Say it in your prayers. Let your children know that, that you're not grumbling about things, finding fault. But you're thankful with all the things that we do have. Do you know it rained probably half a dozen times today. There's a blessing, isn't it? Did, did you thank God for those lovely rains that come? We've got a lot to be so thankful. We're all here tonight, aren't we? Able to come? Some of you don't look the same, but never mind. <laughs> We've got a lot to be so wonderfully thankful for. But they were down and depressed and didn't know where they were going with it. Nevertheless, it's not to, going to continue like that. The dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, referred to before. When at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea, Beyond Jordan, Sea of Galilee, obviously. In Galilee of the nations. Oh, there's so much in that verse. Now, obviously, there's a sense in verse 1 that that could have been referring to something that happened fairly recently. 
he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun, the land of, of Naphtali, and after would, did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea. What is the prophet referring to then? Well, I'm going to give you the biblical answer <laughs> because I think it, it helps to put this down, at least to knock this home first. Come to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew 4 is just sort of getting into the story of Jesus' uh, growth and development and, and then his opening work among the people. So in Matthew chapter 4, it says in verse 12, Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. Now you don't sort of move your eye when you hear that. You think Galilee, yeah, okay, Galilee. But Galilee was not a good word. It's where the Lord Jesus spent most of his time. But it is not a good word in its own becomings. Galilee was right up north. And between that area and Judah, there was all this middle stretch. And the people of Judah thought very little about Galilee. So when we read, he departed into Galilee, verse 12, it's highly significant. Is not this the one that's appointed to be king and heir of David's throne? It is. What's he going up to this backyard place called Galilee? Because that's how it was thought. There was a number of towns up there, but there wasn't anything that was polished up at all. It was a, a rough old place. And it was a mixture of religions. King Solomon, in his great generosity, he gave these to the king of Tyre. There was ten cities I hope I'm right in saying it was 10, I'm sure it was. And uh, he thought, well, the king of Tyre should be very, very thankful that he got some Israel territory. These are cities of, of Israelites, the chosen people. And I've given these to him and he's a Gentile king. But when the king of Tyre went down to have a look at them, he thought, oh, what a grubby lot of old places these are. He went through the whole ten of them and he didn't have any respect for anything. It's like when you get a gift and you don't know what to do with it. Anyway, he said that to Solomon. He indicated that he didn't think much of them at all. Solomon learned out quite put out with that because to be given anything of Israel, the chosen people, the king of Tyre had enough knowledge that that was thought of as a it's a privilege, but he thinks it was a lot of junk. And he virtually told King Solomon that. Solomon went and polished them all up and gave them back again. But that's just an illustration of what Galilee was thought of. Now, if you look at that page, how many times can you see the word Galilee on our page? On my Bible, it's page six, but it might be something different. What's interesting is that you can see it's in verse 12. When Jesus had heard that Jesus was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And you and I just read that as though, well, of course he didn't. But in actual fact, to think that the, the promised Messiah is going up to, to Galilee had a completely different approach as far as the people were concerned at that stage. What? Going there? Who would want to go there? Leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum. There, 
both up in that northern territory as well, which is upon the sea coast, that is, the coast of the, of the Sea of Galilee, in the borders of Zabulon and Nephtalon. Keep your hand just where it is. Go back to Isaiah chapter 9. Haven't you seen those two words before tonight? In verse 1 of Isaiah 9, let's read it. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. That's what Matthew is talking about. And afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, in Galilee of the nations. Ah, the prophet puts it the right way. <laughs> it was not thought of with any um, not of notoriety at all. It was despised. We well, only lived there if you had to. But Matthew goes on and makes a very important uh, statement as far as we're concerned tonight. Reading that verse 13 again. Jesus departs into Galilee, verse 12, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is a, a, sea, a city that's around the lake, it's up the top of the lake, which is upon the sea coast, sea meaning the, the, uh, the lake, in the borders of Zebulun and Nephtali. So that's the two cities that he's speaking about. And where do they come from? Galilee. And so verse 12 has got one reference to Galilee. Where else can you see Galilee in that chapter? Middle of verse 15. Then next, verse 18, Jesus walking, walking by the Sea of Galilee. And you and I think, oh, lovely pictures I've seen of Galilee. I've got some on my dressing table or something like that. And we brought them home from when we were in Israel, and, and it is lovely. It is a lovely picture. But the concept that they had of that is entirely different to the time when Jesus went there. When he went there, it was amazing. Yeah. What about verse 23? It's there again. Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching. Verse 24, and his fame went throughout all Assyria. Isn't that amazing? All on the eastern side there. The Lord went over the river. Syria is over the river. He went throughout all Syria. If you turn to the ninth chapter, you'll be even more impressed with how this is being emphasised. Sometimes we just read this and we don't really sort of pick up what it means, what's the significance of what it's saying. There was another one in that chapter 4 and that was Galilee in verse 25. You can add that to your list. Now if we come over to Matthew chapter 10, then Matthew chapter 8, it says in verse 26, and the fame hereof went abroad into all that land. Was there anybody from Jerusalem that heard one thing about it? All that land. That's where he was. That's where he was concentrating. And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men, etc. But look at verse 29. Look at the, the swelling numbers that are coming to this. According to your, to your faith, be it unto you, says Jesus in verse 29. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man knoweth it. But they, when they were departed, spread abroad his fame in all that country. I don't know if I've ever read it like this before, but this is clearly what it's trying to tell us. We live in a different country in different times and we don't sort of know what their stigma was that they had on Galilee. But this is telling us. And yet Jesus is up there <laughs> with his disciples and he's flat out teaching. He's not so 
not the slightest bit concerned that many of them are Gentiles, many of them were Syrians, many of them were Galileans. They departed and spread abroad his fame in all that country. Jesus' um, work was not limited to Jewish people. He was on the fringe of what was Jewish. Verse 33 again emphasises this. We have to read it carefully, don't we? When the, the devil was cast out, the dumb spake and the multitudes marvelled. Look at that. Underlined it in your Bible. It's, it's amazing. What's he doing miracles up there for? Saying it was never so seen in Israel. Never! And now Galilee's seeing it. And here's, Judah hasn't got a, got a look in yet. But the Pharisees said, He casteth out devils through the prince of the devils. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. This is all up north. Healing every sickness, end of the 35. What a statement. This man's on top of it, on top of all of it. All its weakness, insipid in mankind. All of his weaknesses. He's got the answer to every person's problem that comes up. Never mind whether it's an older person or a younger person or whoever it might be. He knows. And the people are fixed there and then. Oh, what a... What a beautiful thing to read. Every sickness, every disease among these very mixed people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. That's our Lord. That's going to be the king of the earth soon. Grand concepts indeed. He was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Isn't that just a beautiful statement? That's our master. Make no mistake about it. That's what he is. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the labourers are few. What did he mean by switching it to that analogy? Just keep your hand there for a sec and come back to Isaiah chapter 9. Because, do you know, Isaiah 9 uses that terminology in, in the description of the effects of Christ's ministry. Isaiah chapter 9, you'll find this very, very interesting. Verse 2, the people that walked in darkness, that's the ones that we're being told about, have seen a great light. Where are they? Galilee. Just said that in verse 1. Those people, they were the ones in the Old Testament first promised that they would hear and see this preacher. Have you ever seen that before? We have to read things carefully, don't we? Galilee was despised, but Jesus went there first. How remarkable is that? The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Wasn't there dimness? Well, the light is shining on these people. That's what it's saying. The dimness is going. That's why verse 1 and 2 should be linked together with verse 21 and 22. Thou hast multiplied the nation and increased the joy. Sorry, and not increased the joy. I think it means that he had increased the joy because he had multiplied the nation. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest. And as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. It's a time of happiness out on the farm, isn't it? The, the head is coming in and it's full of wheat or barley or whatever they're harvesting. 
and everybody's happy. You get up there with the farmer and he's <laughs> got his big header up there and he's going over the crop and he's happy because he can see all this food streaming into his receipt, into his rece reception. And he's happy. The farm's happy. People are happy. The people in the city are happy because it's the time of harvest. That's exactly what Jesus says. Back there in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 37, Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous. Where did he get that figure of speech from? That's straight out of Isaiah chapter 9. And I think that helps us to see the application to that circumstance. Matthew said specifically that that was related to our, our passage. And that's why he quotes it in chapter... We did read that, did we? Or didn't we? I don't know that we actually had read it in the end. But it's... Uh, Not Mark, it's Matthew, sorry. You've got Matthew chapter 4. Well, there it is in verse 15. Well, let's get the, the introduction so that we know where we're going. Matthew chapter 4, and leaving Nazareth, which was one of the towns around the, the lake, he came and dwelt... Not, no, not Nazareth. Nazareth is much further over west than that. He came and dwelt in Capernaum, that is on the lake, which is upon the sea coast in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali. Deliberate. It's deliberate because he knew what Isaiah had said and he's doing what Isaiah said he would do. That it might be fulfilled, verse 14 which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, what did Isaiah say? The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. Not Galilee of the Jews, is it? It's Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, Light is sprung up. How beautiful is that? That's the prophet's words. Matthew's picking it up and saying, when Jesus went into that area, he did it because of the chapter we're looking at. You couldn't have a better cross-quotation than that, could you? It's absolutely beautiful to find that. And it shows, doesn't it, the Lord knew all about what he had to do. He didn't say, oh, I want to go down to Bethlehem because that's where I was born. He didn't do that. I want to start my ministry there. All my family relatives are there or something like that. He went where the prophet had said he should go. How beautiful. And when he spoke of it, he said it was like a wonderful harvest. Here were all these people that were once sick and now they're all happy. It's like a harvest. There's joy there. Look at them. They were all happy. They were miserable before. They were in dimness and darkness. Didn't know what to do with it all. But now they've got it worked out because this wonderful man has come into their region. Is Isaiah chapter 9 a beautiful chapter, my dear princess? It is a very, very beautiful chapter, isn't it? Thou hast multiplied the nation, verse 3, and increased the joy. They joy before thee as the joy in harvest. Matthew picks that up and uses that, or the Lord picks it up and uses that terminology. Very, very subtle, very beautiful. Verse 4 then. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. That's a bit, a bit tricky, that phrase, because the day of Midian is the day when... Um, The uh, Gideon, Gideon, when the day of Gideon was uh, asked by God to go forward in the salvation of Israel. And he whittled down his numbers until he only had 300. And they had just exactly what he wanted each one to have. 
And he went down and he listened, didn't he, to what was being said in the company of the enemy. And they were fearful, very fearful. And he heard it and he brought that back to his people. So although there were only 300, and it's, although their leader was scared stiff himself, yet they had an amazing victory. It says of the, the people that they were fighting that they were just so numerous you could never count them. And yet here's this little group that are you know, well behind the military terms. But because of the faith of Gideon, he was able to convey that to the 300 and they had a sweeping victory. They even got the kings of those countries. That's the day of Midian. It's uh, easy to find. It's in Judges, in chapter 6 and in chapter 7. That's what it's referring to. The day of Midian. It was a clean sweep victory. And that's why the terms are brought here into this passage here. The rod of his oppressor as in the day of Midian. Wasn't that everything that happened in that story was perfect, but it was a sweeping victory that Israel received and they never thought they had any chance. The strongest man they had of them was wanting to hide behind the, the cupboard, you know. He didn't want to go because he didn't think he had the talent for it. But it was a sweeping, unexpected victory. That's why it's brought into verse 4, because of those qualities. Put a little note there. See Matthew, so rather see uh, Matthew 18, there's a reference in the margin which says, Judges, there it is, chapter 7, verse 22. But it's uh, two chapters there, really, to read. So, what does the, tr the prophet now go on to say? For every battle of the warrior, when men go to fight, is with confused noise, tremendous noise, excitement, and all sorts of cutthroat statements being hoarded ho 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 at each other, and garments rolled in blood. It's a terrible scene. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. There's going to be energy in this. What is he coming to, my dear brothers and sisters? Where is the prophet going? Well, all of a sudden, he returns to Emmanuel. For unto us a child is born. All this great thing that he's been speaking about, which is going to turn away the dimness and the, and the soundness and the uncertainty, the lack of faith, all that's going to be swept away. Who's going to do it? For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. What an amazing, amazing chapter it is. Everybody loves a new, new little baby on the scene, don't we? We all get a great joy out of that. Well, it's been promised. But is it going to be different to the one that was promised in chapter 8? Emmanuel, mentioned twice there, and in the previous chapter as well? No, it, it, it isn't going to be a different child, but it might have some other features to it. So this verse here, 6 and 7, give a very much expanded picture, of which we're just going to deal with it for a little bit now and more later on, because it is a very, very beautiful part of Scripture. Look at him. Can you see him? Unto us. A child, child, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Government? We haven't got any. There's a mad king around the place that brings apostasy and wickedness to the nation. The government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful. Does things, 
says things that are beyond what other people could ever think to say or do. He's wonderful beyond what men might otherwise be able to do. It's a good thing that the government is upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. He's good to talk to. Like that man called Jesus, who was found around those towns in Zebulun and Naphtali. And not only was curing their physical difficulties, but was giving an answer to all the problems that they presented to him. Because he was great in counsel. His mind was expansive and, and wonderful. In chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, that thought will be expanded. Just quickly pop it in. Have a look at chapter 11. Verse 1, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of its roots. So he's in the right direction, isn't he? He's from the Davidic stock. So it's, it's in line. And the spirit of Yahweh shall rest upon him, verse 2, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. He's got it all there outlined in the opening of that chapter 11. But here it's just brought together in one word, really, counsellor. And then it's called him the mighty God, and we'll deal with that next week. And then also the everlasting father. Do you know, in the kingdom, Jesus is going to be a father? Of course he's going to be a father. He'd be older than anyone else, wouldn't he? Of course he's going to be father. And in a sense, we're all his children. And there's passages like Isaiah chapter 22 which actually to disp speak of him as though he were father of that age. So although it's uh, unusual for us to have this expression here, yet there are other passages that uh, we'll look at next time that show that's consistent with other passages in Scripture. And because of what he's doing, he's the Prince of Peace. Well, you imagine the people hearing this, listening to... Isaiah making these statements and thinking, goodness me, what about the man we've got as king? How does he compare to that? Would you vote for this man if you had the option of either one? He's a remarkable person. And he's clearly in agreement with what has gone before. Is he in the Davidic line? Yes, he is in the Davidic line of the increase of his government, verse 7, and peace, there shall be no end. Recent kings, A has included, all fell off the line. Hezekiah, Hezekiah, Zedekiah, he, he, he reigned for 25 think, years, I think, Hezekiah. He reigned for 25 years, which was a reasonable time. But uh, it wasn't very long, was it? But of this man... Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Where then will he reign? Upon the throne of David. Did we link that up with 2 Samuel 7? The prophet's doing exactly the same thing, isn't he? And everybody in Israel would have picked that up. He's going to be of the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even for ever. The people would have cried in the streets, wouldn't they? To think the prophet was actually saying that and meaning that and saying with such fervent carriage of his thoughts. We know it was so because the next phrase says, the zeal of Yahweh of hosts will perform this. Not just words cheaply out on the, on the corner, that some words have to be said so some are said, but the zeal of Yahweh of hosts. He has spoken. The Lord sent a word unto J Jacob, and it hath lighted upon Israel. Just at the end of 
chapter 10. There's a little expression I just want to put as a footnote to tonight. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27. It shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. The anointing. What an anointing is that? The anointing of the house of David, isn't it? So that line's been kept, isn't it? Right through. The Bible's a beautiful thing. Beautiful thing, isn't it? it? really is. How privileged we are to know those things. I wish that all the world would listen. You know, they are working, publishing the things to the public might be blessed. Perhaps we have to work harder in that area, my dear brothers and sisters. Perhaps we have to work during the day when we meet people, when we have opportunity to put a few words in the right, <laughs> right position. Perhaps we're too scared to do it, aren't we? Or have we lacked the, the means of doing it? I think a lot of those things are worth thinking about. I went through our little role today, <laughs> you know, just looking at all our membership and seeing where we all are. And, uh, yeah, you come away with quite a number of thoughts. And one of the thoughts I think is really a true one is that we don't know easily today how to speak to people or to find them at work or find them where we are working. But it's us that have an anointing. Who else knows about the promise made to David? What is that promise that we just read? What would that mean to someone off the street? But it means everything to you and I, don't know. We are very blessed. Thank you. Well, thank you, Grandpa, for your words tonight. Um, it was really amazing, wasn't it, to consider how the people listening to these uh, prophecies Isaiah is giving, how they would have thought about them and responded um, today for us I guess it's a, a lot easier uh, with the New Testament and it's amazing seeing the threads going through 2 Samuel 7 through Isaiah and all the way through to um, when Christ walked on this earth as well so thank you very much we'll now have some announcements from Brother Dave and the collection tonight is for Hebron Oh dear. Uh, so, God willing, uh, class one next week, Brother Peter Pullman's to run that, lead that, with um, considering Hebrews' overview, uh, the supremacy of the Son of God. And in a fortnight's time, uh, Brother Brian's to continue the Emmanuel prophecy. Um, further this week, God willing, uh, Saturday, uh, 4.30, the suburban young people got double study day. Sunday's details. In the morning, we've got uh, Brother Samuel Luke exhorting. Brother Tim Penn is presiding. Brother Phil Archer is reading. Brother John Nichols is organist. And in the evening, Brother John Hendrickson is to give the talk. And there's a BYG supper after. Thanks, Brother Dave. Um, I just heard a whisper from Grandpa. I think he's looking forward to some more Messiah voluntaries after we close with him in prayer. And I do apologise. I think I got a bit excited at the start and got my Emmanuel's and Messiah's all mixed up. Um, I'm not sure if you noticed or, or not. But the hymn we're about to sing picks up both Emmanuel and Messiah. So we'll sing together hymn 296 followed by prayer. Thank you.
Let us pray. O oh Lord, our great and our mighty God, we come before you at this time thankful for this evening that we've been able to share together around your word. Father, truly your word does give us a glorious hope. We are so thankful that 2,000 years ago your son came at the right time to a world full of darkness and to that world brought a message of glorious good news. A gospel for the ages then, for the ages now and for the age that is to come. And Father, we are so thankful that here in this place you have allowed your light to shine through the darkness of this world and into the darkness of our hearts to bring us light and knowledge, knowledge of your glory and of the glory that you revealed through your Son as he declared in all things that you were right. Father, let your light shine in us, that we may reveal your glory, and that in the time to come, your glory may increase and fill the earth when your Son reigns as the mighty God, the wonderful Counselor, when everything will be done to your honour and to your glory. And as we've considered, please help us to Take the responsibility of this knowledge, the responsibility of this light, that we may share it and show it to those around us. As we bring our night together to a close, we ask that you will be with us until we meet again. And may it be in the kingdom of your Son, in that glorious day to come. Amen.